The proposal would see AGL's last remaining coal-fired power stations close by 2030, about a decade earlier than current plans. That means the business would reach net zero emissions sooner. The AGL board rejected the offer, saying it undervalued the company. These are serious players and I would doubt if they don't intend to sweeten it and purchase the company. AGL's already accelerated plans to close coal stations in New South Wales and Victoria. And just last week, Origin Energy said it would close Australia's biggest coal-fired power station seven years earlier than expected, in 2025. Renewables are coming in at a rapid rate and um, more storage coming in, it's getting, it's getting cheaper. Australia's installing renewables at a cracking rate, 10 times the world average on a per capita basis. In 2018, renewable energy peaked at 38% of supply to the national energy market. Last year, it reached 60%. In the face of this growth, coal has been declining as a power source for several years, and that'll continue as more power stations close. Mike Cannon-Brooks is the Chief Executive of Atlassian and a Principal of Grok Ventures. Mike, so AGL's position is that you didn't offer enough cash. Was that just your starting bid? Look, I think this is how these things play out. Uh, I think we feel that our bid is very fair value for shareholders, uh, especially in um, uh, when considered in relief to the alternate offer, which is the, the demerger that's on the table. Um, but uh, we continue to work collaboratively with them to see how we can move forward. Last week, Origin Energy announced that it was closing down the Araring uh, coal-fired powered station, and that was also going to be sooner than was planned. That's what would also happen if you took over AGL. What's prompted what seemed to be uh, these moves suddenly to accelerate closures? I'm not sure it's about accelerating closures. I think it's the, the natural state of the market, right? These are often uneconomic assets that are often running at a loss and are going to be increasingly running at a loss as we go forward, right? They produce very expensive energy and electricity, uh, and we need them to be replaced in their creation. So uh, I think what people are making is very commercial decisions, as we saw at Origin, um, and as we would argue is the commercial decision for AGL is these things are not running in 2045, right? You can bring it forward to 2048, 2045. Economically, I, I can't understand how that happens without some sort of massive subsidy coming from somewhere because the, the model just doesn't bear out that it's still running there. Well, on this question of the economics of it, if Australia doesn't transition to renewable sources of energy more quickly than planned, what do you think will happen to the country economically? I think it results in a higher power price, right? Fundamentally, uh, the um, new sources of energy, so renewable energies and storage and firming, all the technologies, are cheaper ways of generating electricity. So as we retire older generators and put in place newer generators, they should come at a, a cheaper replacement cost for per watt, per watt hour, however you want to think about it. So it should bring the price of energy down. If you delay that transition, you will keep a high price of energy. And that's what we're seeing in the market, right? Uh, we had announcements today, last week, that we are uh, in the lowest energy prices we have in eight years. And that was trumpeted as a, as a big celebration as it should be. The reason for that is because our grid has passed 30% renewables. And as that keeps going up, AMO's integrated systems plan, everyone else will say that the prices will keep coming down because they are a cheap way of generating electricity. I think the Morrison government on the price question is looking at it as a supply demand kind of thing. And uh, it argues that renewables are not going to produce as reliable as a supply. And so therefore, if you have less supply, the straight demand equation drives up prices. Uh, look, I think it's a very simplistic way of looking at the, what is a very complicated energy system. The, the reality is we have a market that's now priced every five minutes. And so supply and demand will match, and that includes firming and all of the other opportunities that are out there with modern technologies that we have today to deliver that uh, power reliably. And by that, I mean it's 24 hours a day when people need it, supply meets demand. So I don't see that that's any different. Um, the government has also come out and said they want this to be solved by private markets. So that I think is what we're putting up with the capital and execution to show that we can get it done, right? Uh, one of the biggest differences is we're putting $20 billion after the acquisition into creating those replacement assets. So that can be handled um, predictably, I suppose, uh, between the, the retirement of existing assets and the replacement with new assets. Do you think that it matters whether the coalition or Labor is in power federally in terms of the decisions that private investors are going to make about moving into this renewable energy space? 
I, I don't think which government is there should matter. I think what matters is the predictability, the stability of energy policy, uh, which fundamentally di dictates the risk premium attached to these projects. So one of the things about Origin bringing forward the closure of Erring uh, and our bid, these give more signals to the market of where things are going to be in three years, four years, and five years, which will bring down the risk premium for new construction projects, which will hopefully accelerate those projects. So the more stability whichever government can give in policy and settings and circumstances, the more that, that private capital will come in to uh, fund this transition. And let's face it, we need an awful lot of private capital. $20 billion sounds like a lot. It, it is a drop in the ocean compared to what we need to transition our economy entirely to be decarbonized. But that is what we have the opportunity to do in Australia better than almost any other nation on earth. And we should be taking advantage of that opportunity. You gave $50,000 to Climate 200 in the last federal election. Are you donating to help any partic particular political candidates this time around? I, I have not, I haven't even, uh, uh, I don't think an election's been called yet. So uh, I, I haven't done much on the election. I've been a little busy, to be honest. Um, I know it's upcoming at some point, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, so what happens now in terms of AGL? Uh, look, we're continuing to uh, present our case uh, to work with shareholders and to work with the company um, and obviously to work with any other stakeholders in terms of federal and state governments and various states uh, to explain our plan and explain our bid and what it means. Uh, and also presented as a counterfactual. There is a current plan of record on, on, on paper in terms of the demerger. So any questions asked about our plan should be asked of the alternate plan as well. Uh, and we think on, on paper, it stacks up extremely well with the value for shareholders and the risk and predictability for the market itself. Mike Cannon-Brooks, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.